These evidence-based standards provide a great framework for best practice in cancer care. And the 2016 publication is extensively referenced. However, patient care mistakes and medication errors still happen. So it's imperative that we reviewed the current literature and looked for new evidence that's been published. If there was new evidence, looked to our experts on the panel for what things that they had implemented in practice that were improving cancer care. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Weimer, Manager of Oncology Nursing Practice at ONS. And today we're talking with Michaela Olson, Clinical Program Director of Oncology at the Johns Hopkins Health System based in Baltimore, Maryland, about the new ONS and ASCO Anti-Neoplastic Therapy Administration Safety Standards. Thanks so much for joining us today, Michaela. Can't wait to talk to you about this topic. I think it's something that a lot of our nurses are excited to hear and see. I know they're going to want to learn more. Thanks, Jamie. So let's start off with talking about why it was even necessary to update these standards. So the former version was the 2016 ASCO ONS Chemotherapy Administration Safety Standards. Why did we update them? They probably would have been updated sooner, but we had a little glitch in there with the pandemic. And so it was definitely that that little thing. (laughs) Yeah, it was definitely time to get these standards updated. These evidence-based standards provide a great framework for best practice in cancer care and The 2016 publication is extensively referenced. However, patient care mistakes and medication errors still happen. So it's imperative that we reviewed the current literature and looked for new evidence that's been published. If there was new evidence, looked to our experts on the panel for what things that they had implemented in practice that were improving cancer care. And we know that organizations providing cancer care really utilize these standards frequently as they focus or should as they focus on staff training requirements and all of the processes related to medication preparation, labeling and administration to reduce that patient harm. So we needed to get back into the literature. We needed to give updated recommendations. It was definitely time for an update. ONS and ASCO wanted to ensure that these standards reflect the current best practice but also it's been eight years since this publication and we have had an explosion of new therapies, new sites of care are being implemented and new technology. So it was really time. And these standards apply to both adult and pediatrics receiving. Now we can talk about in a little bit what we now call anti-neoplastic therapy instead of chemotherapy. So let's talk a little bit about the target population for these standards. Who were these created for and who do you anticipate will use them? The target population for these standards are first our patients, adult and pediatric patients with cancer who are receiving antineoplastic therapy, but as well as those who care for patients with cancer. And we're not distinguishing between the healthcare worker, the caregiver, all people who care for patients with cancer, including those practitioners or healthcare workers that are not in a traditional oncology setting. That's so important. And as you mentioned, with the explosion of therapies reaching into new locations and caregivers that aren't maybe, they don't consider themselves oncology practitioners or clinicians, but they are still caring for oncology patients, patients who have cancer and who are receiving cancer therapy. So it's great to know that all of those people were considered when these standards were being updated. What about the audience? Who is the target audience for these standards? So the audience is, first of all, oncology clinicians. We spent a lot of time on this panel writing the definition. So it was very clear who people were in, as we use terminology in the standards. So an oncology clinician, when we refer to that in the standards, that's, and there's a definition list that's published at the end. That's a licensed nurse, like a nurse or pharmacist, a licensed clinician, or it could be a non-licensed clinician, like a patient care assistant or tech. So we refer to people as clinicians that are licensed or unlicensed. We refer to providers such as MDs and APPs as licensed practitioners. 
So you'll see some differences throughout the standards and it's important to go back to your definition list, but they are the target audience, all healthcare administrators, all healthcare organizations, home health providers, and other related healthcare providers or organizations that are not in the typical oncology setting and our patients and caregivers. I really appreciate the distinction of just those different roles. And as you said, a reminder of being familiar with or reminding yourself of the differences in those terminologies as they are applied in the actual standards themselves can help create clarity as you move through the standards and it talks about who can do what and when. Having that terminology straight is really important. Absolutely. You said it perfectly. That's exactly why that needs to be done up front and then there'll be less confusion. So let's talk a little bit about the methodology that was used as these standards were developed. Can you talk us through that? The ASCO Evidence-Based Medicine Committee standards process is what we followed, and that includes a systematic literature review that was conducted by the ASCO guidelines staff. We first came up with research questions around all of the standards and then gave those to the ASCO guidelines staff, and then they did the systematic literature review. An expert panel provided critical review and evidence interpretation to inform those standard statements. And then the final guideline, once written, was approved by ASCO, their Evidence-Based Medicine Committee, and the ONS Board of Directors. So a very, as you described, a very thorough, very robust process to ensure that all current relevant literature was included in evaluating what needed to be changed. Exactly. So now let's kind of dig into it a little bit. What were some of the high level changes to these updated 2024 standards? This, like you said, is really the meat and it's really exciting. So some of the high level changes, and then we can get a little bit more in the nitty gritty. A big change was in the title, the term chemotherapy. It's really no longer an inclusive term, right? We need to define all types of therapy for cancer and chemo is one type of treatment modality. The explosion of the new therapies that include cellular therapies such as CAR-T and other exciting emerging treatment options are not our traditional chemotherapy. And so the term antineoplastic was agreed upon for all these therapies to treat cancer. That definition in the standards is, and I quote, all antineoplastic agents used to treat cancer regardless of the route. And that's important because the previous guidelines were not as inclusive about that. So it doesn't matter the route of administration, you still have to follow the same standards. And I think that's really important because we have new antineoplastic treatments we're giving intradermally and intrahepatically and intraperitoneally and all different kinds of routes. So it's really important. These include targeted agents, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, cellular therapy, all of our antibody drug conjugates, bispecific antibodies, the checkpoint inhibitors and new things that we're getting ready for right now, some new biologics and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and other cellular therapies. So very, very inclusive. But I do want to point out the hormone therapies were not included in this edition and they were not included in the definition in 2016. Oh, that's an important distinction. I'm just listening to you read off that list of just different drug classes or different, you know, categories. It's like, did any of those even exist in 2016? Or at least not, maybe not as many of them. It's just it's such a long, complex list and just goes to show how quickly things have changed. It's just such an exciting time in oncology right now. Another high level change was the new language about the location of administration to include new healthcare settings. We know that antineoplastic medications are given in a variety of settings, not just your typical inpatient or ambulatory oncology infusion center anymore. We've got health plans that are increasingly developing strategies to direct patients to more convenient and less costly sites of service, such as the physician's office or home infusion, unregulated sites, and more care is being given in these settings. So it's really important that we adapt the standards to make sure those patients treated in the home or in a freestanding center are given the same opportunity for safety and quality. In some of these freestanding centers, the ordering oncology physician might not even have a relationship with those folks. And so the standards can serve as a really important framework for setting up these programs to make sure our patients are safe. And then in addition, we send our patients home a lot with their antineoplastic therapy. This is becoming more common. We have infusion pumps that are pretty 
phenomenal that have guardrail in them. And we can send our patients home with five of you continuously. And we can even have our patient or the caregiver do their port deaccess and take down the chemo in the home. And so we've got to have lots of things in place to protect both our patients, but also their caregivers and family members who are in the home. And if we believe these standards should be followed in our oncology areas, we should make sure that's true everywhere. And then finally, I just want to reiterate that antineoplastic therapy can be dangerous when given via any route, and the standards don't differ between these. It's such an exciting time in oncology, but that means we're doing things that are innovative and new, and that means we're not just giving our traditional IV chemotherapy anymore. We're giving lots of sub-Q therapies and lots of therapies in many different administration strategies. So we've got to make sure the standards are inclusive of those. And they are now. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And just hearing you talk through those changes that have happened and just how patient-centric they are, trying to create changes that really provide so many different benefits to the patient. You know, you mentioned the access at home, just remembering and acknowledging just the the challenge and sort of the burden that was for patients to travel, especially traveling long distance, to have to come and do that. And so, as you've said, these standards provide clear guidance to all of these new and changing methods of administration, and it will just help keep everyone safer. So I'm excited to talk more about them. So the standards address seven overarching research questions that span across four domains. Let's start with the first domain. Can you review that first domain and highlight any key changes that were made? The first domain is about creating a safe environment. And the first thing I want to highlight, which is not necessarily new, but just something that we really clarified with that language I talked to you about in terms of who are clinicians and who are licensed practitioners It does say that there needs to be someone on site at all times that has basic life support capability certification and then a licensed practitioner on site and available to staff who administer antineoplastic therapy in the healthcare organization. Those are two things that were there before, but were just clarified. And then I think also we expanded the sections on fertility status and pregnancy status. So the healthcare organization has to have a policy for pregnancy testing prior to initiating antineoplastic therapies. And the healthcare organization has to have a policy for assessing risk of pregnancy in patients while receiving antineoplastic therapies. And then finally, the healthcare organization has to have a policy for determining a patient's desire for ongoing or future fertility preservation prior to initiating the therapy and make appropriate referrals when feasible. So that language is stronger. And I think that's really important for our patients. We know that cancer is being diagnosed in younger people at higher rates right now. And it's important that we take into account reproductive and fertility status in our patients. Absolutely. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that More structure, firmer statements, clearer descriptions of what is required regarding fertility status, pregnancy status. All of those are certainly welcome changes to these updated standards to give clear guidance on really what the organization needs to have in place. And so the nurses can make sure that they can follow that policy. Exactly. And nurses need to know where those policies are and refer to them. The other thing in domain one that I think is crucial for nurses to understand, because it's a big change. And we made this change based on the literature that looking at patient safety events related to inaccurate weight and height measurements. So the domain one has a standard 1.7 that says weight and height are measured and documented in the medical record in metric units only. And I see that a lot when I'm going around the country. People still have their scales in pounds and their height in inches. And we've got to change that. We shouldn't be converting things. Both the measurement and the documentation are verified by two individuals, one of whom is a licensed clinician prior to preparation and administration of a newly prescribed antineoplastic treatment plan. The measurement is repeated when clinically appropriate as determined by the policy of the healthcare organization. So it no longer says prior to every encounter, it says two people, one being licensed, has to check the height and weight before you initiate the therapy. That's really very important. And it's going to be a big change for us. Healthcare organizations are going to have to figure out how they're going to implement this because it is going to take some work. 
but I think it's a really great safety intervention for our patients. I couldn't agree more. I just knowing, again, it's just human error that is part of it because we are humans and we're doing this work, but pushing the wrong button on the keyboard has a very significant impact when it comes to weight-based dosing. And so just adding that second double check just to make sure that we all have that second check just to help us make sure that we didn't hit that wrong button. I think there are lots of alerts and things that can be programmed into the EMR, but even that sometimes isn't going to catch it. So I think it is, as you mentioned, maybe some workflow rearrangements will be needed to help accommodate that, but it is what is going to be the safest for the patient. Right. And I think that We know that if we do it wrong at the beginning, it can propagate forward for a long time. So really important. All right. Well, let's move on into domain two. The second domain includes patient consent and patient education. So what are some of the areas that we highlight in this section that had some changes? I think that the biggest changes here was, first of all, an emphasis on documentation of all their current meds at each encounter or visit, including their herbal medications and complementary medications. We know how important it is to know what our patients are taking and make sure they're honest with us and forthcoming about that. And not to forget things like there are herbal things in tea that people drink and and other things that maybe aren't even on their radar list as a herbal product that could be interfering with their chemotherapy. Educating our patients on the long-term and short-term adverse effects of therapy, including those infertility risks for appropriate patients, and then educating our patients on pregnancy prevention, including contraception. Those are big pieces in this domain number two. Definitely some much needed improvements and some specifications there. So those sound like those will be very helpful moving forward. So domain three, I think that's is where everyone jumps right to when they pull these out, because yeah. this is sort of where we live most of the time for many of us that work, especially in, in infusion therapies or are doing the administration. So domain three includes ordering, preparing, dispensing, and administering antineoplastics and includes some of the most substantial updates. So please explain to us what some of those updates were. Domain three was a lot of work. The expert panel spent a lot of time in this domain and made some really significant changes that I feel very passionate about. And I think that once adopted, they will improve safety. One I want to point out for sure is that new orders or changes to orders for antineoplastics, regardless of the route, including the dose and schedule changes, are communicated directly to patients and are documented in the medical record. So why is this important? There are are many times where sites use a prescription, whether that's electronic, it is recommended in the standards to use an electronic prescription at all times so that it's in that patient's medical record. It is recommended to use electronic medical records instead of paper. And what happens though, is the patient will call in and the provider will tell them, well, you're having a toxicity. So just take one pill a day instead of two. I'm just giving that one example. And then the provider never documents that that in the record and on that patient's record, it still looks like they're taking full dose. Well, if they get admitted to the hospital, someone's going to potentially bring that medication through the medication reconciliation process as is and put that right on that patient's chart and start giving that higher dose. So now all doses, all changes have to be documented in the medical record. I think that's really, really great. In addition, I think a big focus on some key changes in the verification checks, the safety checks. Let me just tell you about 3.10, which is again about oral antineoplastics. They must be ordered in the electronic medical record or on pre-printed forms that's going to reduce error and documented in the medical record, whether dispensed by the ordering healthcare facility, an alternative facility, or a specialty pharmacy. Again, these are newer, although oral antineoplastic therapy has exploded and we're using a lot of these other pharmacies, specialty pharmacies, et cetera, we've got to make sure we have the same level of care. So that's detailed in here, which I really, really like. And you can read in here, For preparation and labeling, and it includes both oral and parenteral, it specifically gives you the items that must be on those prescriptions and on those orders so that we're being inclusive. The verification steps, let's go into that. Let's talk about the four verification or safety checks. I think this is what we've all been wanting to clarify, and I'm going to try to clarify it the way it was put into the standard. So 
the first verification is done, and I know we still have nurses in some areas of our country preparing antineoplastics. So before we prepare the antineoplastic, the personnel approved by the healthcare organization to do the preparation or compounding, if you will, have to do a verification. And I'm not going to read you each item that has to be verified, but it's all listed in the standards. So before preparation, and then the second verification is upon preparation. A second licensed clinician approved by the healthcare administration has to verify certain things like the drug vial is correct, the concentration is correct, the volume is correct, the diluent type. You can see that those two verifications are in that pre and post compounding. Now, the third verification is what nursing is may be doing with a pharmacist at some times as that second licensed clinician, but we are the ones administering the chemo or the antineoplastic. And so we're doing that third verification. That third verification is an independent safety check. And in my opinion, should be done in a quiet place where you can go through and do the safety checks that are listed in the standards quietly and thoughtfully without being in the presence of the patient or caregiver. Those are done in an attempt to do some preliminary safety checks to make sure that when then when I go in the room to do my safety checks, we often call those bedside safety checks, that if I have an error before that with a dose or something, I've caught that before I get to the patient side. So that's the third verification. I think it is helpful as you talk through and gave those examples really to explain how that might feel or be different than what we have been doing since before these standards were updated. Right. And the way I think of it and the way we do this in my organization is that third verification is our chemotherapy safety checklist, which is more extensive where we're checking any labs that would preclude administration. We're checking to make sure we did the patient education. We're signing off all these things. And then a second nurse is verifying everything. That's kind of my idea of the chemo checklist, where you want to do that in a quiet place and you want to make sure you're ready to go and you've got a consent and the right people have signed the orders. And then that fourth verification process is in the presence of the patient, at least two licensed clinicians approved by the healthcare organization to administer or prepare. And we put that wording there very purposefully because you may have one nurse in that small practice and one pharmacist, and they may have to be each other's checks and balances. But two licensed practitioners are going to the bedside or chair side of that patient and doing checks, including the drug name, the drug dose, right patient, the right rate and duration of the infusion, the route, specialized filters or tubing needed. And then finally, the infusion pump settings, including the rate. So before you press start on the pump, your second person is doing a verification. So now remember, I said, this includes all sites of care. So we have some work to do as obviously we're not sending two nurses into the home to give antineoplastic therapy. But the cool thing is now we have lots of great technology. So the standards say in person or through appropriate institutionally approved video enabled technology with at least one person on site. And you verify the patient's identity using at least two identifiers and document the accuracy in the patient medical record. And then all the things that I previously listed. So very distinct safety checks. And I think it's so important. And you've given us great detail about how each step is potentially in a different physical location, maybe not spread out differently, but not only where it's done physically in your environment, who is doing it, when it happens in the patient's journey, you know, during their appointment that day, when is it happening? Each of those really has a distinct purpose and a sort of a slightly different focus in terms of the safety and the rationale, but dividing those steps up very clearly helps provide that space and that time to be focused and knowing what you're looking for and when. I think the last step, we've already seen some questions and some healthy discussion about some of these changes. And I think what we've heard a lot is that step three and step four of that verification, sometimes it's hard to piece out how that will occur at your site of care. How is that different than what you're currently doing? I think one great example that I've heard is that fourth step to me, feels very similar to like blood administration. Exactly. Doing that 
two person reading, making sure what's in your hands is what was ordered and that's the right patient. And I think, as you mentioned, all of those actual physical things, you know, think of all, if we'd gone through this whole process and everything was right, but then somebody programmed the pump wrong, (laughs) like the rest of it was for naught. So being very precise about the programming that you do, the roller clamp, for goodness sake, doing all that and then forgetting to unroll the clamp, just really lots of detail added to this likely maybe is not drastic changes for some sites. And that's great. But I appreciate that that detail was given and those four steps were clearly delineated to make sure that it is clear that there are four different points along the way that really we need to stop and make those checks. I love that you said like blood because I've been preaching this in my organization where we have done a health system look at antineoplastics and dual MAR sign so that we can initiate dual MAR it was trickier than we thought, but we're doing it across all six of our hospitals. We don't want to just turn on dual MAR and have a second nurse sign it. We want them to know what they're doing in that room. And we want it to be just like blood. I use that analogy too, because I'm just going to pretend you're in Pittsburgh today. If I came to ONS in Pittsburgh and we were checking blood together, I bet we would do it the same way because it's one of those things that's just been ingrained in us as nurses. I want and hope that our bedside safety checks for chemo someday will be the same. But what I pointed out earlier is you don't want to be in the room and realize I've got the drug in my hand and the creatinine's three, and it was supposed to not be more than one, or the platelets are 50 and they were supposed to be 100. You don't want to get in the room and realize in front of the patient that there's no consent or that one of the signatures isn't there, or there's not a, whatever your requirements are, are not in place. You want to get all that done in your third verification step so that when you go in the room, it's just those final patient ID and drug safety checks. So I love it actually. And I hope that people will begin to understand the differences. I also am a big advocate for chemo safety stations and designating a place with a computer where the chemo is delivered into designated bins and the nurse can stand there and do their safety checks once the drug's delivered in a quiet place. And maybe that's the med room or if the med room's not available, another designated place, but not at the nurse's workstation because You need your bag and your drug to do some of those checks and you don't want to bring chemo into your workstation and then have environmental exposure. That's a very good point. In domain three also, I wanted to point out some really nice wording changes to the standards or additions to help support not only our patients, but providers and nurses. They have to do with supportive care. We have the healthcare organization must have a policy for anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity reactions, and they must have those order sets and medications accessible and able to be given within an appropriate time frame to those patients. One example I like to give is that sometimes when I visit freestanding clinics, they don't have access to an RRT team or a code team. So they call 911 and an ambulance comes and they depend on the ambulance to bring for instance, epinephrine to give for anaphylaxis. And we know that delaying the administration of epi for someone in anaphylaxis can be detrimental to that patient. So this kind of strengthens the language that we really need these sites to have those medications on site. We It also, one of the standards is to have an infiltration and extravasation management policy and to make sure that those antidotes that you need for let's say, a vesicant infiltration are available and on site within the appropriate time frame for treatment. We know some of our antidotes have to be given within a certain time frame. And then there's an addition to the standards, which is a cytokine release syndrome management policy is present and aligns with current literature and guidelines. And again, you have to have the antidote for that cytokine release syndrome to be accessible and available to be given in the appropriate time frame. So really good supportive care standards for our patients. So have policies and have the medications available. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think you, you highlighted it perfectly. Certain medications for hypersensitivity should be available at all sites that are giving these drugs. When you think of things like extravasation and antidotes and and some of the medications for cytokine release syndrome, they might not be stocked at your home pharmacy where you are working and where you're administering. It might be something centralized within your health system because they can be expensive. They don't want them to expire if they order a large stock because they're not thankfully not used maybe as often. So it is important to understand if that's not at your local pharmacy or where your drugs are stored on site, where is that next place? How would you contact them if you need it? Those are all important things to know. 
Exactly. And we even deal with that in large organizations where we have smaller satellite sites and we can't keep it there. So how do we work with if our own site is too far away? Is there another hospital within the region that we can partner with? So and then test those workflows to make sure that in peak traffic and everything, you can get those drugs at a timely manner. So certainly domain three is heavy and we need to spend a lot of time there, but I think we've done a great job of summarizing some of the really notable changes and improvements that were made to that standard. Let's move on to domain four. How have the domain changes in domain four, what were some of the main things that we see there that you would like to highlight? Oh, yeah. So domain four is monitoring during and after antineoplastic therapy is administered, including adherence, toxicity and complications. So the healthcare organization has to have a policy for emergent treatment of patients that is aligned with the current literature and guidelines and then availability of emergency equipment, rescue agents and antidotes. That's all kind of wrapped up here in domain four. Very important, including the patient's home. Again, including all sites of care. The other one is the healthcare organization has a policy that requires ongoing assessment of barriers to adherence, including social determinants of health and financial constraints. So that's an important one. That'll be a challenge to put in place because some places already have this, but it's again, a really important one. And so we've got to have ways of monitoring toxicity, monitoring hypersensitivity reactions or other toxicities to therapy and being able to assess those in a timely manner. So now the big question, after we've covered all the changes and some of the notable impacts to maybe workflows or staffing, how do you think healthcare organizations can begin to assess sort of the state of affairs that they have at their institution and how they would need to make changes to implement these new standards? It's a great question. Healthcare organizations really, I think, should start by doing a gap analysis to determine where are the antineoplastic therapies being given. And if you're in a very large academic medical center, you may be surprised in the nooks and crannies of where these antineoplastic therapies are given. I know in my organization, we are giving them an interventional radiology where we're giving intrathecal chemotherapy, intrahepatic chemotherapy. We're giving antineoplastics in the operating rooms, in intravesical routes and intraperitoneal. We have urology clinics, which are often doing the bulk of our intravesical chemo. And then, of course, home and freestanding infusion sites. So first find out where all the antineoplastic therapy is given that would be applicable to these standards. And then start to by doing a gap analysis, looking at the various standards and figuring out how closely aligned are we and where do we need to go to get there. I find that to be the most helpful tool. And I think a lot of organizations do this with ISMP recommendations and other recommendations. Absolutely. And it all starts with reading the new ones. So we'll be sure to link where you can find the new updated standards on the ONS website. We'll link those to the episode notes so they're easily accessible. Certainly encouraging everybody to review them, understand what has changed. And and as you said, Michaela, just start with doing a gap analysis. What is different? What are some of the things that your institution might need to change or tweak just to make sure that you're accommodating the new standards as they've been written? Right. And there's quite a few that I didn't mention in particular, but at least you have some highlights now and you can print those standards and study them more and do your own analysis. Well, Michaela, thank you. Anytime I get a chance to talk to you, I learn so much and I just appreciate your time and sharing your expertise with our listeners today. As we approach the end of our episode, we do like to always finish up with a series of quick questions to summarize some of the topics that we've discussed today. So to start that off, What is something about this topic, safe administration, that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? I feel like nurses know a lot of this and we live it day to day. And I think that what I wish was that more providers and other healthcare professionals knew what it is that we do every day to make people safe and to ensure that we give safe delivery of antineoplastics. So just sharing these standards with all of your interprofessional colleagues and coming together as a team, that will be such a valuable way to tackle this, I think. What are some common misconceptions about the standards that oncology nurses might have? Maybe that they don't apply to them. I think that standards are put out for a reason and they may not always be in 
enforceable or something that you're going to get audited for. But what we know is these standards are put together by experts that are very passionate. This was out for public review. So we had opinions and thoughts from people all over the United States that added to these great standards. And I think whether you have somebody watching you and asking you how compliant you are or not, it's the best thing to do for our patients. And so I hope that all people that all healthcare organizations and healthcare workers that give antineoplastics will take these standards seriously and want to do this for their patients and for themselves. What are some additional resources that oncology nurses or healthcare organizations can access if they want to learn more? Of course, the Oncology Nursing website has the publication in their manual. It's in C. John, right? Correct. It's on C. John and we've got it posted on our website as well. And then some other additional resources that I found helpful, ASCO has a supplement and clinical tools and resources available on their website. And that's www.asco.org forward slash standards. And there's a PowerPoint and some other resources for implementation that are there. And then there's patient information available always at www.cancer.net. ONS also has, of course, the ONS Chemotherapy Administration Guidelines. Those of us that were on the expert panel that are members of ONS or even work for ONS, like Chris, who's a wonderful nurse that works at ONS that's been part of this for a very long time, we made sure that we had a voice there about what are our safety standards and kind of oncology nursing ways of doing things in the guidelines that were crosswalked with the standards. And I think you should always go back to your publications, Mm -hmm. your safe handling of hazardous drug book, your ONS chemotherapy book, your second edition, and, and that will provide even more resource for these standards. Those are wonderful resources that you shared. And I, again, want to acknowledge and thank both you, as you mentioned, Chris Lefebvre, our, one of our oncology clinical specialists here at ONS, for sitting on that panel and being part of that collaboration, as you said, to make sure that the nurse's voice and the nurse's needs are heard. And our experience in this is brought to life, to accurate light in how these standards are developed and updated. So it's so important to have that seat at the table. And, and again, thank you for your time representing um, alongside Chris on that collaboration. You're welcome. And my biggest hope is that we have some nurses that listen to this podcast that say, I want to bring these standards back and talk to my physicians and my pharmacists in my practice to elevate the care in our area. And I hope that they are embraced with that. And I know that we will all give them support to do that. That would be my biggest hope to hear some success stories about how people have really initiated these standards in their practices. I love it. Well, thank you again, Michaela, for your time with us today. Do you have any final comments to share with our listener? Nope. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part in this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guest and not necessarily ONS.